welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We are absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we are a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Today, we are excited to welcome Linda Randall to the show. Linda Randall, DVM, KPA, CTP, LLA, Tag Teach Level 3, and the owner of One Smart Dog in, is that Seville? It sure is. Lovely uptown Seville, Ohio. Seville, Ohio, here in the United States. Linda sold her veterinary hospital in 2019, where she had practiced as an ABVP board certified diplomat companion animals for 20 years and also worked with exotics. She then opened One Smart Dog, a full service dog training facility, the month that Ohio shut down for the pandemic in 2020, which she says was, quote, exciting. Linda has been engaged in dog sports, obedience, agility, and field trials with her flat-coated retrievers and sheep herding agility and scent with her border collies. Her passion for behavior grew from learning about training from a variety of trainers. She is a crossover trainer and realizing that although all the trainers she worked with felt like they had a method that worked, only a few took time to develop insight into why animals did what they did or had the curiosity needed to want to understand what function their behavior had. Most had a, quote, top-down method of working with dogs, which the more she learned about the science of behavior, she found uncomfortable. Then a friend came back from one of the first click conferences and talked about clicker training. Linda couldn't get enough information about it. She started attending positive reinforcement conferences such as Clicker Expo and taking classes, living and learning with animals is a favorite, and joining intentional R plus communities such as the Animal Training Academy. Linda works hard to maintain a positive presence in her daily interactions with friends, clients, students, and instructors. It can be difficult to run a full service dog training facility, maintain her relief veterinary business and find time to do webinars and conferences. But Linda feels strongly that effort is worth it. She especially finds joy in working with kids who want to learn to train their dogs. With their increased ability at a young age to have excellent hand-eye coordination, hello cell phones and video games, Kids make wonderful, compassionate trainers. She believes that engaging with another species and working in age-appropriate spaces helps develop compassion for others and encourages acceptance of diversity. Linda has produced a four-hour series on kids, race, and positive reinforcement for the Heart Academy. And along with her co-host, Kathy Narina, MD, KPA, CTP, NACSA certified instructor, Linda has spoken at the Convergence of Human Behavior and Animal Training and Technology, or the CHAT Conference, the Lemonade Conference, and is speaking this fall at CPDT. Linda and Kathy discuss trauma-informed and trauma-assumed care in animals and people with an emphasis on the intersection of animal training, human caregivers, and behaviors. As a Black woman in the majority white profession of veterinary, professions of veterinary medicine and dog dog training, Linda has had experiences that have been life-changing and soul-searching at the same time. She is inspired to support others who have ventured into these worlds and to seek a deeper understanding of why we do what we do and why
why we believe what we believe. Behavior can help and it can hurt both the giver and the receiver. In a world of increasing compartmentalization of groups and anger directed towards those considered other, she hopes encouraging a behavioral view and positive reinforcement interactions will, in some small, tangible way, make a difference. As Linda says, we have to try. Welcome, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, In my bio, may I make two small corrections? Well, not so small, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, go for it. Yeah, I am speaking at APDT, and uh, so I'm sure that in my typing, I might have typed CPDT because I'm going for certification in CPDT. It was on my mind. And uh, Kathy Narina is certified in scent work, which is NACSW. And so I'm sorry. That's okay. I wondered about that one as I was reading it. I was like, is that NACSW maybe? So, okay, great. We'll get those fixed for the show notes so that those are both corrected in the show notes notes. Thank you for, thank you. yeah, thank you for alerting me to that and sorry about not for not noticing that sooner. So thank you. Well, no, it, it comes from me typing at three o'clock in the morning because my schedule <laughs> is such that sometimes I'm doing a lot of work at times when I should be doing a lot of sleep. I completely understand <laughs> that is um, unfortunate and something that I think that several of us probably have in common. So I, I, understand. I think so. Well, I'm so excited to have you here with us today, Linda. You are one of the few guests I've had on the show who I have actually gotten to meet in person before. So it's always right. Yeah. So it's always we were dancing. We were. You were leading that dancing. So, and that was at the first chat conference. Yes, it was. Um, What year was that? Do you remember? I am thinking it was 2018. That's what I was going to guess too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was a lot of fun for sure. It was, it was. And that's something I like to do. Anybody who would like me to come and lead a dance at their conference, you just let me know. (laughs) I think you're going to get a lot of invitations for that. We we do Lindy Hop or something other than Lindy Hop, but it's fun. And, um, and then our paths have also cra- crossed previously virtually outside of the Animal Training Academy in um, Hannah Brannigan's wonderful Zero to CD program. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's always fun for me to have somebody, you know, it's always fun for me to have people on the show who I don't know at all, but it's also always fun to have people who I know a little bit like you. So I'm excited to get to know you even more today. And I would like to invite you now to maybe share a little bit of your story with us. How did you get into all of this dog and training stuff that led you to chat and ATA? (laughs) Well, I took a broken arrow path to everything that I've ever done. It's never been, oh, I want to do this. And then I had a goal that I I just plowed through everything and worked with that single-minded I've got a goal. I've got to get there. And a lot of it, unfortunately, has to do with uh, not really being supported in the goals that I had when I was small, you know, when I was five years old or 10 years old. My parents supported me, but um, my community did not. I actually grew up in Connecticut, which my hometown is Southbury, Connecticut. Hello, Southbury. And in that town, uh, my my parents uh, chose to live there for a lot of different reasons, but they were the only uh, black family that were trying to buy a house there. Nobody would sell them a house. And so the people who sold them a house, remember this is in the 50s, uh, were actually Ukrainian refugees from World War II who had developed an area which was called Russian Village, despite the fact that they were Ukrainian. That's at, at the time, uh, the Russian, Russian Village. And And they said that they would sell them a house. So I grew up in a Ukrainian, Russian, Ukrainian, Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking community and uh, went to Russian classes with their kids. So I I grew up from about, I'd say, uh, nine years old through my early teens with uh, Russian as a second language. And no, I don't speak it today. I don't understand it today. But at that time, I spent a lot of my time there with uh, a lot of cultural things that were were delightful. And 
So it started started with that, with that feeling of having a community of people that were in a community of their own because they were ostracized by the people around. And then they took in a Black family and we became community. But as I was growing up, I was the only Black student in school through grammar school and then into high school, except for my brother, uh, who when we went to high school refused to go. He said that he would not go to an all white high school and go through what he saw me and we're two years apart. Uh, go through. And he chose to go live with my grandparents in Danbury, Connecticut, which had a large black community. And uh, so, and he wisely, I have to say, chose to do that. So he lived away from home at that point. And so I negotiated that uh, on my own. At the same time, I kept choosing things that were out of my economic class and out of my racial and cultural comfort zone. For instance, I wanted a horse. So my father, wonderful person that he is, and never talked about what he went through to be able to get this horse, but he got an old ex-polo pony that somebody was giving away. And so he said he'd take it and he brought it home for me and I started riding. And I uh, became, I got as far as being um, just short of the state champ, in other words, second place, <laughs> state championship on uh, junior jumpers. So I was riding jumpers. So there you have a wealthy community of people when you think of Connecticut and they're riding hunter jumpers. And there I come along. And by this time I had a quarter horse and was competing against <laughs> thoroughbreds and warm bloods. And there I'd come was you know, black girl on her quarter horse, but my quarter horse could jump. I could ride and, and we did fairly well. So um, at, at the time I knew I wasn't welcome, but I had a group of people that um, kept me safe, I guess, in, I could say that, and that's in retrospect. And my father went through a lot to do what he did and to help me do something which was not inexpensive. And um, but as a child, he kept that from me. So I didn't realize it. At the same time, we had a Labrador retriever and a boxer. And I thought that I would train them to do the same jumping my horse was doing. And so I did that. And I had no idea what I was doing. I did not take lessons. I wasn't a member of anything, but I had an affinity for it. And I could teach those dogs to do almost anything that I could think up that I wanted them to do. And so I wanted to go to veterinary school. And my veterinarian who came to take care of my horses just kept nodding his head and saying, well, you could try. <laughs> and I thought, but I took that as something positive. I didn't realize as well you could try, man. Are you crazy? You'll never get to it. I thought, well, he said I could try. So, okay, I'm there. Um, but my high school guidance counselor said, Linda, you got thrown out of your high school biology class. Do you remember that day? And I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> I got back in though. And you got a D in physics. You hate math. Why are you going to, going to try to go to veterinary school? You'll never get in because of all of that. And you're black and you're a woman. So I thought, oh, OK, well, I guess I'm not doing that. And I went on and went to Earlham College, a extremely well thought of a liberal arts school in Indiana. We were going west, you know, from Connecticut. I was sure we were going to end up with cowboy hats and all of that. So we went to Indiana. And uh, at that school, uh, I was fortunate. The only reason I could go was because I got a full scholarship. And it was there that I continued to ride and I continued to be interested in animals. But everybody again said, I don't know, veterinary school. And because you didn't take any math, you didn't take any science in your four years of liberal arts. I'm an English major, English literature major with a history, American history minor. So, OK, so then I said, I guess I'm not going to be a veterinarian again. And then I went and taught high school in Poughkeepsie, New York. And then I answered an ad in the New York Times and ended up working for the Nigerian federal government. And it was finally there that as I was teaching in the middle of the country, I got to know several of the nomadic herders and talked to them about their cattle. And I thought, I want to go to veterinary school. I want to come back. I want to be involved in helping the, in the economic sphere 
of cattle raising and uh, they really needed a lot of help. And that was my goal. So when I came back home from teaching in Nigeria, I looked at five veterinary schools and uh, chose Ohio State, moved to Ohio to get state residency so I could decrease the cost of the education. And I went to school, I got in and I went to school to, uh, well, be a large animal veterinarian and go back to Africa and to work there. But midway through, I realized how much I loved the science of medicine. And if you're going to work with large animals at that time, especially, and do what I was hoping to do, I was wasn't going to be working with what had then become a passion of trying to decide what the disease is and trying to work through that. And at the same time, working with the economics of the situation that that was not going to be that was not going to be happening. So I pivoted and went into companion animals. And then I became board certified with the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. And while I was doing that, I kept saying, well, I also am interested in behavior. And everybody said, oh, Linda, you won't be able to do that. You know, you have to know neuro neurological things. They can, you know, neuroscience and bioscience. And that's just not your strong point. You know, you'll, you'll be fine working with you know, internal medicine and surgery and uh, just just do that. And I thought, oh, OK, I guess I'm not going to do anything with behavior. And I went on. But then eventually I fell into clicker training. And as I was working with electronic collars, uh, with the retrievers, I kept thinking, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be something else to do. And I was working with people who were actually very good at it. And uh, and I respected how they worked with it. And then for a while, of course, I didn't know any better. And I hate to put it that way, but that's really how I feel now. At the time, I just kept thinking there had to be another way. But I was thinking of it more uh, like train tracks going along a different way, not better or worse. So I wasn't putting a value on it exactly, although I knew I was uncomfortable with it. But when I learned more about um, R plus training and clicker training, I started moving in that direction. And slowly, it took me a few years to let e-collars go completely. And I knew I had really let it go when I was cleaning out my garage and there was my e-collar and I looked at it and I had kept it because I thought, well, somebody might want this. And I thought, I don't want anybody to have this. <laughs> I'm throwing it away. I don't want somebody to come and buy it and actually use it. <laughs> and, and I thought, you've really made the turn at that point. And so that's basically how I got to where I am. And just because I'm an entrepreneur, with my veterinary hospital, because I worked in a dairy practice for 10 years uh, and, doing, and did the small animal. And then I asked that doctor as he was selling his practice to another dairy practitioner, if it would be all right if I opened a small animal practice close by so I could keep the small animal clients. And he said, yes, I want to sell this as a dairy practice. You go right ahead, do what you need to do. And so I opened my small animal practice and I thought, I'm going to do a little dog training off in the side. We didn't have a fence. We just had grass. And I started dog training with no fences and all the Siberian Husky people, of which we had quite a few for some reason, um, kept saying, my dog's going to run away if I take him off leash. And I, with my retrievers who are coming back, no matter what I say, oh, come on over here. And they're just right there. I was at the point where I was saying, well, you should teach them just to stay with you. <laughs> And I thought, all right, Linda, you know, how how R plus is this? Maybe you should put a fence up. I mean, that's only fair, right? So I put up a fence. And the next thing you know, people are saying, well, you're having class in the rain and in the snow. I said, yeah, you know, I train retrievers. We in my border cars, we go sheep herding. It doesn't matter what the weather is. And then I thought, OK, how R plus is this, Linda? Maybe having something with a roof would be a good idea. And then it had sand. And then people said, we're getting sand. Our dogs are getting dirty. Okay, maybe I could put some turf down. You know, it's really cold in here. In the Okay, maybe I can put in some overhead heating. Well, you know, it's really hot. Okay, maybe I can put in some fans. Next thing you know, I have a dog training facility that I can use in any weather. And, and it was all because I had, I don't know. And why did I go on about that? I don't know. But when I sold my veterinary hospital, I then leased 
leased a 12,000 square foot facility that had just been redone from a warehouse. It is lovely. It has got air conditioning. It's got heat. (laughs) I can regulate the temperature and it's got turf that's competition turf, competition equipment. It's, It's gorgeous. And that's where I am now. That's how I got to where I am. And um, I don't know. Do you want to know more? Oh, I want to know lots more. <laughs> um, <laughs> but first of all, since we're on the subject of it, um, uh, why don't you tell us what's happening at that new facility that you, your one smart dog, large 12,000 square foot, did you say yep. facility? So mm-hmm. what kinds of classes are you having there? Are you doing private work there? Are you doing retreats there? What's going on at that place? Well, the training facility I had at Cloverleaf Animal Hospital is called the Agility Underground. So you can tell from that our main focus was agility. We did other things, but it really was what we were known for. When I opened One Smart Dog, I said, well, we need to do some behavior things. We need to uh, get puppies started right. And so I had all sorts of ideas. And it's just now, and I'm going to say roughly two years later, even though we all know it's longer because of course we didn't open during the first year of COVID. And uh, we sort of halfway opened halfway through the year, just like everybody. But I don't really count that because it definitely was not a (laughs) moneymaker. You know, all I was doing was spending money. So we're just kind of catching up now and expanding. Um, I just recently went from six instructors, all of them part-time to 10. And uh, some of them are really major part-time, in other words, 16 hours or more a week. And some are just there two hours a week. And with that, I was able to bring in uh, people who were certified and some people who are not certified and are very, very good at what they do. And I hope we'll pursue certification at at some point. And we have a a puppy program. We have a very big, robust agility program. Uh, We have enough square footage to have AKC trials. And we also do rally. And uh, I have somebody who's uh, certified in aggression training through through Michael Shikashio's program. So she does aggression and reactivity. And uh, she also is a giraffe behavior trainer down at the wilds, uh, which is just south of us here. So she's got wonderful skills. And I have someone else who does our puppy program and uh, we do scent work, a lot of scent work. So there is hardly any dog sport along those lines that we don't do. Um, If we were going to list the ones that we don't do, because some of our local clubs do these very, very well. And there just is is no, I don't want to, you know, I, I enjoy those clubs and they do what they do well. And that would be fast cat, barn hunt, things like that. And I'm frisbee all of that. So we don't, we don't do that. So that's, that's where we are. It's, it's what we do. We've got a matted area, turfed area. We're on a hundred acres. We've got a, what is now was a nine acre pond. And the, the shore is almost a mile to walk around, but it was just redone and dredged. And it's now, I would say 11 or 12 acres. And uh, there's some paddle, we've got some paddle boards and kayaks on the beach. This is all my landlord. He put all of this in and we've got a full size competition, soccer, football field in and woods and areas back there. We just had morel hunting classes back in our in our woods and that was really fun. And uh, so we, we do a lot. We're on beautiful acreage, lots of good parking. I can't say enough great about it. And that all has to do with my landlord, not me. That sounds really cool. And I'm wondering, when are you going to have a Midwest ATA meetup there? I know as soon as <laughs> somebody from the Midwest says we should have a meetup, meet up. how about one smart dog? <laughs> Because uh, we do have meetups for zero to CD. We've had three, three years and we're going to have another one this year. And people come, they camp there and bring their RVs. And we have uh, three days of wonderfulness. Um, one year, I always try to do something when people are driving or coming in that distance. Uh, one year, I took them down to a robotic milking parlor where the farm talks about positive reinforcement with their cattle, which is 
why with their dairy cows, uh, the positive re- uh, how they're positively reinforcing themselves and how as farmers, dairy farmers now, they're positively reinforcing the cows and they are therefore giving more milk economically. Positive reinforcement in dairy cattle is uh, a boon to the farmer and how much better the farmer's lives are and the vacations they can take. So that was a big hit. It was it was wonderful just talking about positive reinforcement in dairy cattle. And then uh, last year we ended up uh, goat training and we went to a friend who's got goats and we clicker trained the goats. We had platforms and everything. And so we spent an afternoon goat training. So we tried to do something a little bit different. We went on a hike one year and uh, did things on the hike. So yeah, so we we do meetups. It sounds like tons of fun and like you have an amazing place for that and lots of really interesting things nearby to to see and do as well. Very cool. Um, ah, like I said, I have a million questions for you, more than we'll be able to get to here today, I'm sure. But um, it's because I keep talking you asked me a question and a it's half good. an hour later, I'm through answering. <laughs> it's good. I like it. I like that. That's wonderful. Um, one question that I had as you were kind of telling your story, you um, mentioned that you're always choosing things outside of your comfort zone, outside of your financial comfort zone, outside of your racial comfort zone. I think you said um, I did. just pushing yourself outside of all of your comfort zones, probably, uh, probably more comfort zones than those two, I would guess as well. What what do you think drives that? I have no idea because I want to stop pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I want to stop working so hard. I want to enjoy what I've done and to delve into each thing deeper, but in a more relaxed manner. And every time I think I've done that by saying no to think people ask me to do something, I went on, oh, okay, I'm just going to start saying no. And then as things end, I'll have more free time. I'll do this. I'll do that. And somehow it it never happens. And I know my friends always say, it doesn't matter. You're never going to stop. So you should stop worrying about the fact you aren't stopping and accept the fact you're not going to stop. And maybe that'll bring you some comfort or some equanimity or something. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know what drives that. I Sometimes I think it's part of um, how I grew up in that both my mother and my father tried very hard to instill in us that feeling of needing to do more and be better. And uh, when my when they divorced, the first thing my mother did, having no college education at all and being a mom, and that's it. And then no husband is, did she go out and, and immediately get a job? No. What she did is she wrote to all of the game shows on TV at the time and uh, want to and to be a contestant. I mean, there we are in Connecticut. She can make it very quickly into Manhattan. She got on six game shows. She won all of them. And when they said, do you want this car or this refrigerator? Or do you want, you know, X amount of money? She always took the money. And then she kept winning and she kept taking the money. I can remember my freshman year in college in Indiana, we're walking down the street, myself and a bunch of friends. And all of a sudden, one of them turned. Remember, I used to walk by TV stores when they had TV stores and the TVs would be in the window and you just glance and see it was on. And they said, this is your mother. And sure enough, there was my mother on the match game. And I didn't even know she was on the match game. So we stood in front of the window for a while and watched my mother win. And then we walked off. So that's the kind of family I I grew up in. And um, unfortunately, my father was an alcoholic, which is why they divorced. And that also not only convinced me not to drink, which I don't, but it also said there that there but for fortune is that I also grew up thinking I had DNA <laughs> in me that if I didn't watch what I did and didn't choose well, that I would slide down and be living out of a cardboard box under a bridge. And I still feel that way. If I don't work harder, if I don't do this, if I don't do that, somehow it's not just that I'm not going to make progress. It's that I'm going to wake up one morning and, and be home 
homeless and bedraggled wondering what happened to my life. So I'm constantly chasing something so that I'm not there. Yeah. And I'm, you know, constantly writing, saying, do you want me on your game show? I could do really well. <laughs> How about your webinar? <laughs> that, that's interesting. And as I was asking the question too, I was thinking that I imagine probably, I would guess maybe multiple things drive it in different contexts to that kind of the things that you're describing right now are maybe some of the big underlying forces, but maybe sometimes there are other motivators at play too, possibly. I'm not sure. But another motivator that I'm thinking about that could be at play was something that you ended your your bio with, which was, you said, we have to try. And that made me think of some of the other things that you talked about in your bio and some of the... Um, tasks or um, things that you've taken on, uh, chosen to do. And I was thinking about the the series that you did with the children, the series, mm-hmm. I believe, about race and positive yep. reinforcement. Yep. Could you share mm-hmm. a little bit about that with us and oh, what you definitely. were trying to do there and what, what, sure. got, what came of it? Yeah, uh, definitely. And what brought that up is once again, just like I said, I was raised as part of a Black family and a white community. It's the same with veterinary medicine. And it is also the same with dog training in that I'm in two majority white professions. And I've I've paid the price for that in a lot of ways in both the dog training and in veterinary medicine. It was more obvious in veterinary medicine, probably because that was my livelihood, as opposed to in the beginning, dog training was not my livelihood. But uh, I can remember in the field trial situation, for instance, the reason I stopped doing field trialing was because I I would do as as I would do okay pretty well with my flat coats and. Uh, But at night, because at that time, everybody had either their RVs or in my case, I was sleeping out of my car. But, you know, I I spent that you spent the night at the field trial site and I would be walking back. And of course, you can't couldn't see anybody because it was nighttime. And I would hear conversations about me and saying that that N word person doesn't belong here. Who does she think she is? She can't, you know, and she this and she that. And they were very, very derogatory. And, you know, I, I didn't have the money they had and I didn't have the race they had (laughs) and I didn't have the breed that they had Labradors, you know, so all, all around. And finally, one time I was, I was just in tears. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to go back out on the field the next day because that particular conversation happened to be among people that I thought were supportive of me. And the other conversations I wasn't as surprised at, but these were people that I would have considered friends. And uh, so, and that was the last field trial I ever went to. And so I thought, okay, you know, what else, what else can I do with my dogs? What other white facing community can I join and see what I, I, you know, I, it never, it occurred to me to stop. I'm not going to say, oh, it never occurred to me to stop. Well, that's not true. Of course, every day I thought, why am I doing this? And when I opened my veterinary hospital, the KKK had a rally. Uh, they didn't, didn't want me there. And as a matter of fact, I had to move where my hospital was because the next door neighbor in the community, which was only a quarter of a mile, literally down the road, uh, but the, a township line divided uh, the two properties, the one that I'm I built on and the one I tried to build on that needed zoning. And uh, they actually went to a zoning meeting and one of the zoning people wrote on there that he wasn't living next door to any end person. And uh, with that, they ended the zoning committee meeting. And I had my architect and an attorney there for other reasons. And I said, what just happened? Why did they just end this meeting? And it turned out that the zoning person had written this note. So it was in writing that he had done this and they stopped the meeting at that point. And then I had to take, I took them to court. We never Never ended up in court because they knew they were going to lose, I think. But in any case, in the end, I got my zoning and and people came all to say that I shouldn't be there, that 
they painted, you can imagine, dire pictures of how the community was going to go downhill because I built a veterinary hospital there because all the all these black people were going to come into the community. And it, it just went on and on and on. But in the end, I did get my zoning. And then, of course, I wrote them a letter and basically said I would never open a hospital in their community. But it only took going <laughs> a quarter of a mile down the road where it was already zoned for a veterinary hospital. And I built my veterinary hospital there. So my tax dollars at least went there and uh, I was successful, but it was rocky and it was painful. And um, I had to have um, I had to have police support, we'll just say, but protection uh, for a couple of years while I was there. And because I lived at the hospital and they had to come in. And one time they actually I don't want to say broken, but came into my apartment without contacting me with all their searchlights and woke me up. And they said, oh, we got a call saying that uh, you were dead. And that's why we came in. And so it, it was tough, but I persevered. I did well when I got board certified. Um, that was also something that was unique in the area. And I got a lot of clients because of that, lost a lot of clients because of that. But so, yeah, I went through that. And so when I opened the dog training facility, all of my students uh, were white. And I got interested when you speak about the webinar about why parents chose to bring their kids to me. And it seemed like a good topic because I had one child, a uh, young girl uh, who's black and and that that was it. And by the end, by the end, when I after about 15 years. So but all of the others were, were white kids. So that that was fascinating to talk to them and to see how they grew and what they thought of me being black when they walked in. And I had talked to their parents about whether they had told them that they're going to go dog training and their instructor was going to be black or whether they didn't say anything. And uh, so and how that informed their lives, both how the kids saw that it informed their lives and especially how their parents saw it. Did it change anything? And I also wanted to know about the positive reinforcement training that did they see a change in their kids after they started doing clicker training, basically? And so I, I hold on to that a lot because it says that I, I did good work with that, that it was the right thing to do. And they all did get something out of it, whether the kids stayed with me for one fall season or whether as one of them did and competed and was winning and was with me for eight or nine years. And I was talking to her when she was in her 20s. And so she'd also been away for another eight years. And what did she remember about being a child? So I had the whole age range. I've had kids from three years of age and up. That's really interesting. And so was that was that a three part series, the webinar? And yes, that- uh, four part, actually, but but three meaty parts and one part that was more of an introduction to the kids and all of that. And is that still available for purchase yes. somewhere if people are interested yeah. in that? With Andrea Harrison's Heart, Heart Academy. Yeah. Heart Academy. OK, hopefully we can link to that in the yeah. show notes yeah. for people. And so it was a, a four part series and you were uh, just doing like interviews with the children. Yes. I had no idea how to do research. I am now taking behavior works, how research works and I needed it. <laughs> but, um, and so it was purely interview and really I, I did it just based on what I questions I thought I should ask. So is it professional and as, I, as a professional, interviewer would do? No. It's Linda Randall talking to the kids and hearing what they had to say and uh, then bringing their parents in separately. I interviewed the kids by themselves. I had permission of the parents. They didn't come in at all and they didn't talk to the kids about what they were being interviewed for until they got there so that there wasn't a conversation at home. I really wanted to hear what the kids thought, what they had to say. And um, it turned out really, really nice. And they had good things to say. They had 
things that I never in a million years even realized that they thought about. I think there's definitely something to be said for really nice research and really well-designed research projects and that sort of thing. But I also think there's something to be said for just open-ended curiosity without those kinds of constraints Yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious. I don't know if you can share this with us or not, if you can share kind of some of the things that you learned or found from that. But but I'm really curious about the parents' perceptions and uh, maybe even behavior. Did you learn anything there that you could share? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> the parents said that they noticed within a couple of weeks, first of all, the kids starting to correct them, and uh, which is you know such a kid thing to do. Oh, no, mom, you're doing it wrong. This is how you do it. So if they called the dog and didn't have something to reinforce the dog with, when the dog came to them, that their kid was right there saying, you really need to reinforce that mom came when you wanted to. So there, there was that kind of thing, but that then became something that they noticed that the kids started doing with their peers. And if somebody was having trouble doing some, they would start mimicking me. In other words, you know, they said, we could just hear your voice and what they were saying. Well, let's break it down. (laughs) One girl would say to her volleyball team, I know you're having trouble trouble with that serve, but let's take a look at all the things it takes to have a good serve. What's the first thing you do? Okay, let's just work on that. <laughs> and they said that they just couldn't believe what they were hearing from them. And uh, and it, it was just, it was, it was fun just hearing things like that. And uh, when we got to race, I asked them, all of them, the same general questions. And several of them didn't have any people who were not white in their school that they knew of, which was also interesting and very age related, because of course, if you're in certain grades, you only know the kids in your grade, you might pass the other kids, and but they're not in your sphere of influence or interest. So they were really talking at a younger age about who was in their classroom. And they would say, no, there isn't. Or, oh, there's there's this one boy and his father's white and his mother's black. And um, so so there's, you know, there's Greg, He's he's in my class, but it took pulling that out of them. And uh, so that that was interesting. And they felt very protective of people who did have kids of color in their class. They felt very protective of them in a lot of ways that uh, I found interesting and not in a, oh, they must need me you know, white person coming to their rescue, just in a very kid way, in that they would, they just felt if somebody was being bullied, that that just wasn't fair and they were going to do something about it. And um, so, and when I would say, well, would you do that for, you know, for a, a white kid? Well, yeah, you know, they would say yes. And then they would think about it for a bit and they would say, but you know what? It was a little bit different with so and so. She said, I think they were doing it because she's black, or I think she, they were doing it because she's. Chinese or Vietnamese or whatever, you know, the group that the child was part of. And then and they would just think about it a little bit more and say, I just think there was more to it. So I found that interesting. And some of the kids that were homeschooled were a little more cloistered as far as being out and around. But those were also kids that were doing more reading and their parents were trying very hard to make sure that they got out into other communities and did community work and were were out and about. So it was a, a variety. I'm sure that's that's really interesting. I think I did watch one of those when they came out. I don't know that I did the whole series, but I think I did watch one of them. Um, I have a vague, vague recollection of it. Um, I, re- I definitely remember when they came out. And I remember seeing you on live from the ranch talking about them. So mm-hmm. it's also possible that I didn't watch one. And I just remember from that, that I will have to go back and check those, check those out. Yeah. I, yeah. I would love it if you're interested in, if you would share a little bit with us now about some of the trauma work that you're doing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I am working with uh, Dr. Kathy Narina. She's an MD and family practice in Stamford, Connecticut. And uh, she <laughs> she and I met at a family reunion because uh, her sister 
brother married one of my um, cousins and we were both dog trainers and everybody kept saying, you should talk to each other. You should meet, you should meet. So we did meet and we hit it off and we thought, well, you know, we really ought, we're really interested in this trauma. And she was talking about trauma-informed care and in veterinary medicine, I like to call it trauma-assumed care because we, we don't know. And of course, it could be trauma assumed in both cases because you don't know with people either. And should you go through your life assuming people were traumatized? Well, there's there's a gray area there too. But uh, so we started talking about it. And we thought, well, let's let's get together and let's see if we can do something with chat because there you've got human behavior, animal training and technology, all three things that we were using. So we, we sort of pitched our idea to them and that's how we started. And we talk about the neuroscience of trauma and we ask a lot of open-ended questions because it's an really an open-ended topic. You rarely come up with an absolute answer at all, but you can come up with ways forward. And that's what we wanted to talk about. And we wanted to talk about the fact that we've got a, a triad because we have the animals and we have the trainers and then we have the people associated with the animals, whether it's a caretaker because they're in a zoo or something like that, or whether it is a person, whether you you call them caretakers or guardians or owners, however it is, you've, you've got someone that's there with the animal and, and how do you work through that? And at the time we were doing it too, or the following year with COVID, then we started having, as we all know, um, a lot of dogs that were coming from adverse circumstances. And probably if we are honest with each other, we would have been under the category of unadoptable in previous years. But so many people were adopting dogs that you were down to. And I hate the way I'm phrasing this. I'm going to be honest, but sometimes it's hard to put it other ways that are more comfortable or more appropriate. Um, and so I'm just going to use the phrase when I say down to that's you've taken off a top layer of very adoptable animals in that they're the fuzzy, cute dogs and kittens that everybody goes to adopt. And now you've got the dogs that were the pit bulls. And I'm, you know, I'm just going to put it out there. That's so many are pit bull or pit crosses now and had problems that are associated with the breed, but it was also German shepherds. And it was also just large dogs that had anxiety problems, they had aggression problems, and it just, was just a larger number. We saw it in veterinary medicine constantly, and we saw it in training. So Kathy and I latched onto that, so to speak, and wanted to talk about who is adopting these animals and how are they faring with it? And, and how do we as trainers take care of them? And how do we take care of ourselves? Because it's now like being uh, an ER doctor where you're getting trauma after trauma, after trauma and physical trauma, mental trauma, and they're together. And, and how do you work with that? And at the same time, we wanted to positively look at what's being done in the industry for that. And we've got a line care, we've got one health, and uh, there's the new profession of veterinary social work and talking about the bonded family. And we're no longer saying, oh, those are um, people that don't have a place to live. Their kids don't have shoes. What are they doing? with a dog? Why are they spending money on a dog? Because they don't have money for themselves. Well, there's your bonded family. There's a reason that they have a dog. We shouldn't be dismissing or trying to choose their lives for them and say, you can't have this. And we need to not only show compassion, but to understand that this animal is part of their family and it is part of their lives. And you never know what an animal is doing for a family. You just don't know what bonds are created or what bonds were destroyed. And this animal is, is a link to sanity and to well-being. And we have to stop judging that. At the same time, we have to be able to take care of ourselves. The high rate of suicide in veterinary medicine and the high rate of alcoholism and, and drug abuse in all caretakers of all species is, is there. And so we, we've got the 
this whole set. And so we wanted to work with that. And so we have different webinars based on different aspects of that. And uh, in veterinary medicine, I talk about Pandora syndrome in cats, which um, I won't go into it, but the end result is it turned out to be environmental and behavioral. And we were treating it medically because it, it shows as medical, repeat medical issues. The same way you have people who keep coming back to their physician or to the ER with medical issues, when in reality, you have to step back and you have to address the emotional effects, their environment. There are other things that if you can help those things, the medical problems go away or decrease. And so that's what we do with our trauma-informed um, care. We're going to be talking at uh, CP, uh, sorry, there I go again, APDT, um, about behavior and um, vaccines and how veterinarians are often saying, oh, don't take that puppy to puppy class because you aren't finished with your vaccine series or there's res there are respiratory problems going around. You shouldn't start. And it's, but the veterinary behaviorists are saying in their literature, they're out saying behavior is important and the risk of behavioral problems is higher than the risk of puppies getting a disease because they go to puppy class and we need to we need to look at that and they shouldn't be waiting we need them to go and we need them to keep up with their vaccines but we also need them to get into a, a good behavioral setting to help them lead healthy lives so we're going to talk about that and the fact of the rise of tick-borne problems which cause other issues and uh, leptospirosis and a uh, hookworms big big deal and kathy talks a lot about that because we're seeing more of it in people and we're seeing more of it in dogs and they are because they're now uh, there's a resistant strain to the major uh, anti-parasitical medications that we use. And what do you do with that when you're going to the dog parks and you're going here and you're going there? And they can be life-threatening and they're definitely very dangerous in children, especially immunocompromised adults. And so we've got a lot going on now and uh, with COVID and animals getting COVID in people. So it's, it's a... It's something that only in the past, I'd say five to eight years has been completely rising. Every year, it just rises more and more and we aren't talking about it enough. So that's one of our talks that we have coming up is, you know, is behavior a disease? Well, no, but yes. Is it infectious? Well, somebody, you know, dogs model, look at Ken Ramirez, getting dogs to model this and model that. And um, I do more not do more with your dog, do what I do out of Italy, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, so can behavior be catching? <laughs> no, we could stretch that ish that a little bit. And so it's a great topic. That's really exciting. I'm glad that you all have partnered up to do that. And um, so, and I'm glad that these topics are getting more attention, you know, a topics like trauma in animals and humans and um, that compassion fatigue type thing that you mentioned as well, as far as behavior professionals. I think it's really good that these topics are getting more attention. And so you and Kathy are giving a talk at the APDT. <laughs> yes, APDT in Kentucky in the fall. And uh, so that, yes. And Kathy talks a lot about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and about a new thing called HOPE, which is um, some really good research coming out about how to layer on positive experiences, which don't just tamp down the effect of adverse experiences, but actually in, improve people, people's well-being, I would, I would say, and, and help disperse those experiences. And it's now more than just anecdotal. And so that, of course, plays into our positive reinforcement training in and of itself. And so we're really excited about some of the new research coming out. And uh, she's going to talk about that quite a bit. Good. Well, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing everything that you've shared so far. Um, like I said at the beginning of the show, I definitely have a million more questions for you and still do. Um, but we are getting near the 
end of our time. And I know we chatted earlier about maybe veering off course with some of the questions and we have definitely done that. So before we, we before we, which is great, I, I, wonderful. <laughs> but but I, the reason I bring it up is because before we wrap up, I want to give you a chance if I, if there was something that you were wanting to talk about that our questions haven't gotten us to yet or our discussion hasn't led us to yet, I'd like to give you the opportunity to to do that now. Is there anything we've missed? I don't think so. I do want to just um, reemphasize the fact that my, if I had to choose a favorite thing that I do, whether it's in veterinary medicine or in dog training, it is definitely working with with kids and with with their their motivation. And uh, we've had a national junior champion in agility, and we so we do a high end, and but we also do kids who just want to teach the dog to shake hands. You know, shake, give me your paw and shake. And it just, it just fills my half full glass. <laughs> it, it just makes me smile at the end of the day. And my prerequisites for working with kids though has changed, even though I will work with any child. Uh, but if they really want to work with me or their parents want them, that they have to have the right dog, because I find that that's, that's the secret. You can have the most motivated kid become the most unmotivated trainer if they have a dog that just doesn't want to work work with them or just is off sniffing somewhere. I mean, there's only so much that an eight-year-old can be patient about when they've got a goal and those eight-year-olds have goals. And if their dog is not fulfilling that goals, no matter how much we talk about R plus training, the next thing you know, they're off playing soccer and their dog's sitting at home because it's too frustrating. And so I do try to talk to their parents away from the child and about their family dog and try to, to gently steer them in, in a direction that's going to be successful for them and for their kid and for the dog. And sometimes that means coming and working with one of my dogs instead of the family dog. And sometimes, unfortunately, it means they don't come at all because the parents say, well, this is the family dog. This is the dog we've got. And I'd say, yeah, but your kid's going to get bitten or, you know, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. So I have learned how to say no in some cases as I'm working with kids. And that's been a hard lesson for me because that's how much I love working with the kids. I, I wanted to be able to take them all and, and do well, but I love it. I love my junior handler classes. So I just wanted to get back to that because it makes me feel good. And we talked about a lot, a lot about race and trauma and some difficult things. So I wanted just to end on what brings a smile to my face every day. Thank you for talking about, for being brave and vulnerable and talking about all of those difficult things. And then also for bringing it back to such a, a positive thing to uh, wrap up here on. Although there's definitely positivity wrapped up in, um, in one way or another. And I think much of what you had to share today, um, the children, you said those eight-year-olds have goals. I wonder if that's why you like working with them so much. <laughs> Maybe, because <laughs> a lot of the adults don't. If I walk into class and I say, okay, I, did you all do your homework? And they all nod their heads. Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I'll say, so from your homework, what do you want to work on this week? Just give me one thing. I want to make sure I put it into the curriculum for today. I've got my plan, but what would you like? We'll do whatever you do. They always say to me, you just do it. So I'm at a point where I just, I'm not even asking you anymore. I guess you're going to do Linda's plan and we'll all hope for the best. And if something comes up, you just, you kind of let me know. Whereas you walk into the kids class and you say, did you do your homework? Yeah, we did our homework. Didn't you see the video we sent you? Yeah. I did see the video that looked really, really great. And so what would you like to work on today based on based on your homework? Well, and then they have a whole list of things. <laughs> and I love that. They have ideas and they're not afraid to tell me what these ideas are. And they can have nothing to do with Linda's plan for the class. But, you know, I can take my plan and be flexible and make sure I fit in what they wanted to do. And if what they wanted to do was run a course and then you understood finally that they meant they wanted to run the course, not their dog. 
they wanted to say, just give us a course and we're going to run it. Okay. And at the end of class, I give them eight obstacles and they jump all the jumps and they go through the tunnel and they go through the weaves. Ta-da, they say. And I say, that was great. It was, it's wonderful. Uh, that That is great. Um, the reason I thought maybe it was because they had goals is because you certainly strike me as somebody who has goals and ideas as well. So I thought maybe you could relate to them in that way. Ah, well, I, either that or goals have me. I'm not, I'm not sure how it's working, <laughs> but, and also I want to say, every time I say you want to dance, the kids always dance. Yeah, we want to dance. So I put on the music and we dance. Uh, the adults don't dance. <laughs> You had adults dancing at chat for sure. I did. I did. (laughs) I do want to just say too, a minute ago, I said that there was positivity wrapped up. I felt like in much of what you had to say, but I definitely don't want to discount any of the um, pain or horribleness in some of the things that you shared as well. When I said that, as soon as I said it, I was like, well, I don't, I don't mean it in that way, but I do think that sometimes it seems like some of the struggles in your life life you have come out better for or contributed better work back to the world. I I don't know if for is the right word or in spite of, but um, I definitely didn't want to discount that in any way. So I wanted to And you didn't, you didn't discount it at at all. So be assured everything is, everything's fine. And uh, and as I say, all we can do is try and try to make a difference within our small community, because not all of us can make a difference in the world or the larger community, but we can with the people around us and the animals around us. And I think that that is so important and it's what gets me up every morning. Well, we are lucky to have you in our ATA community and I'm so grateful for you um, for coming and sharing with all of us today. Um, could you, and we will, I'm going to ask you to send links to all this. We can put it in the show notes too, but real quick for folks who are listening, could you tell people how they could get in touch with you, how they could find out more about that, um, talk that you're giving at APDT in the fall or find those, um, webinars you've done before or just how people can reach you and find your work? Well, yes, uh, you can find me on our webpage, which is one, the number one, because O-N-E was taken, but we are one O-N-E smart dog. Our webpage is the number one smart dog.com. And it is under construction now. So I am going to just give that little caveat there. And uh, you can also find me, I guess, by my email address would be a great place to find me. And that is uh, one smart dog again with the number one smart dog dot LR Linda Randall at Gmail, one smart dog dot LR at Gmail. And uh, I will answer. Great. Well, thank you so much. And we will link to that in the show notes. Um, Linda, again, from myself, from everybody listening from ATA. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today and share with all of us some of your valuable insights and experiences. It's wonderful being here. And as you know, I was a little nervous uh, about coming on, but it's it's been wonderful. I am so glad I found ATA and I think it, it's a wonderful community. And I know I can ask any question that I have and somebody going to be there to help me. And I love that. And I love that it's international. And I love hearing from people and reading about what people are doing all over the world. And I only hope I can get to some of those places uh, in the near future. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to go everywhere that there are ATA members? (laughs) Yes. And have a meetup. Yes. ATA. (laughs) ATA meetups and dances throughout the world would be wonderful. That's right. Yep. It would. Ryan, I'm sure you're on it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Linda. It's been a pleasure. We do, of course, appreciate all of you tuning in as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, Then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. 
Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.